How many of you uh, have ever preached a message before in your life? Raise your hand. I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. No. Um, <clears throat> and when you do that, how many of you, when you've prepared your message, before you give your message, you actually are going through it in your mind as you're kind of going back over? Anybody? And how many of you, when you've ever done that, got up and then when you in your mind it was great? <laughs> And when you got up, it wasn't as great. <laughs> this morning, I was going over my message, and I got five people saved and ten people rededicated their life to the Lord. So I'm assuming that's good. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles. We are, uh, we've, we've taken a little journey here. Again, Paul is our example. And that's very open-ended in, in choosing the different aspects of Paul's life and ministry is basically the basis of our topic. It is our topic. Uh, one in life, Paul's uh, stand, uh, framed in the phrase, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And yesterday we looked at uh, the idea of Paul's witness. He says, I'm a debtor. I'm ready, and I'm not ashamed. And this morning we continue these broad themes in the Apostle Paul's life with ministry. Uh, Paul's ministry, Paul's commitment to ministry, and, and Paul's uh, uh, focus on ministry for the believer. And uh, in Philippians chapter 1, uh, my introduction is actually a couple of verses. Uh, in, in Philippians, um, actually it's chapter 2. And verse uh, 12, a couple of, of some of my just uh, favorite verses, encouraging and challenging verses. Paul says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your, your own salvation with fear and trembling. And we, of course, go to that work out your own salvation, and, and, and I will today, but we know that's not working for, but working out the salvation you already have. But I want you to notice something here that Paul makes a statement that probably every parent has made. He says, My beloved, as you have also always obeyed, not in my presence only, but also in my absence. And Paul is saying, I'm here. When I'm here, of course you're living for the Lord. But when I leave, I want you to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's yours. God has called you. You may be a part of a Christian family. You may have a rich heritage, and I admire that. I don't. But you may have a rich heritage of pastors and pastors' children and children and missionaries, and that's wonderful. But he says, work out your own salvation with fear and, and trembling. And then he says these powerful words. He says in verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about ministry. We're talking about serving the Lord. Uh, it was quoted this morning, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do our four good works. Well, what are the good works? It's ministry. God calls us to do ministry. Even in the most simple act of service, it's ministry. My, my wife, she's not here right now, so I'm, I'm a little off my game. She had to go back and go to work. And, uh, and, uh, but one of the things she does for me, and, and I haven't told her this in a long time, is uh, she'll leave a, a, an allergy pill. She said, I left an allergy pill on the, on the dresser for you. Thank you. You know, just the most simple act of service. God wants to use us, and sometimes it is a simple act that we do, a consistent act that we do for the Lord. This morning we're going to look at four points or five points. I have to look. I have six pages of notes, so let me go to the back and tell you how many. Five points of, of what Paul does and what Paul thought of ministry. And, and when I read them, you'll know and probably verses will pop in your mind of, 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 of Paul talking about ministry and being committed to ministry. Because we know that once we get saved, God has called us with a worthy calling. Not to just fill our heads, but to serve the Savior. Paul, number one, was this. Paul saw the necessity of men and women...
to be built up and established in the faith. Plain and simple. Paul saw the necessity for men and women to be built up and established in the faith. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, there's a, uh, some powerful verses here. And uh, he makes this statement um, in verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4. And we'll read a couple verses here. He says this. He says, For this I say, lest anyone should deceive you uh, with persuasive words. And we'll come back to that in a minute. He says, For though I am absent in the flesh, um, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. We know he's talking to Christians. Following on down, he said, and that idea of steadfastness is the idea of, of consistency, of stability. And Paul says, I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see that. I'm not here, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you are standing strong. And I want to say something else about stability or the word steadfast. It always implies standing strong against opposition. Be steadfast and movable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. I always picture it getting a stance to be able to, to stand against the wind, um, to stand against the tide that's coming so that I can remain firm. So he's, he's, he's excited to see the, uh, their steadfastness in the faith, he says. Uh, and then he goes on. He says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in Him. And the idea of walking in Christ here is walking or living within the sphere of Christ. Within the sphere of the influences of Christ. And I will say this, that is a choice that the believer has to make. It is not automatic. He is talking to Christians. He is not throwing into doubt their salvation one bit. But he is saying, Be, you're, I'm happy of your steadfastness, but he doesn't just stop there. He says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So walk within the sphere of Christ. And then he uses the word rooted. And the way the language here is in the word rooted, it's a statement that denotes a completed act of salvation. He is not saying get more rooted. He says you are rooted. You are rooted in salvation. It's interesting. I, I, I lived in Chicago for about five years, but never went to the Sears Tower. Now, I know it's called something else, but it's the Sears Tower to me. Um, and 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 when years ago when I took a tour of the Sears Tower, they 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 let us. I think it was in the basement or some lower area. We saw a video or saw heard somebody talk or something. But I'll never forget that they talked about when they were building the Sears Tower that they went into the ground and they went. I'm thinking a couple hundred feet, and I'm not sure into bedrock. Why is that so important? Come on, guys. Just go down there 20 or 30 feet, throw some cement in, no big deal. Big buildings require a strong foundation. And he says, your salvation, you're, you're, you're rooted. You're, you're, you couldn't be rooted in any more of a, a, a firm foundation than our salvation in Jesus Christ. But he doesn't stop there. Look what he says. He says, rooted and built up. Built up here to notice the ongoing process of building on our position in Christ. It's a continuous idea of growth. Not standing still and standing stagnant, but moving and growing in our faith. And we have that, that, that beautiful, the, the beautiful picture here of, of being rooted in Christ, established in the faith. He goes on, he says, rooted, built up in Him, and established. The word established, present tense, passive voice. Present tense is the idea of continuous action. So it's ongoing. So when he talks about being established, it's an ongoing process. But the passive voice is really interesting. If it were in the middle, you would be saying, look at me, I'm establishing myself. It's me, it's my power. But he's not saying that. 
He's saying we are established and we are being established ongoing by the power of the, of the Holy Spirit. And where does that come from? It comes from yielding to Him. Yielding to Him. And I want you to notice something here. And it really is somber and sober. It's, it's in these, these verses here, there's a frame. There, there's, there are bookends, I should say. In verse 4 we read, it says, Now this I say, uh, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Warning. Some will try to perceive, persuade you with persuasive words. Will try to move you away from your calling. Will try to move you away from the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And what they'll do is this. Is they will try to get in your mind and in your thinking. You trying to find hope, peace and joy in something other than Jesus Christ. That's exactly what the end result is. Remember we talked about in, in uh, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. The fact that the wisdom of the world does not lead to God. It does Just the opposite. It leads away from God. So when you look at the philosophies of man, it, it deifies man, and it doesn't even lessen God, it does what? It removes him. Removes him from the equation. But I want you to go to verse 8 and keep going here. He says, rooted and built up in him, established in your faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. But notice the other warning on the, the, the other end of this verb, of this passage. Beware, lest anyone should cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, or tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. Folks, that's where we live. That is the philosophy that pervades our, our, what we watch on television, what's on television. It pervades what's in the news. It's everywhere. That's, what we, that's where we live. But look what he says, the last uh, four or five words there. And he says, and not according to Christ. Do you know what Paul's doing here? Is he saying the philosophies, the empty deceit, the traditions of men, the basic principles, principles of the world are opposed to Christ. And if we want to stand firm in the faith and be established with, with, upon the roots, upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, we have to stay in the sphere of Christ. Or as he says, walk in Christ. So Paul was committed to being established in our relationship with Christ. Paul was also committed to be established in our doctrine. And we'll talk about doctrine more tomorrow. And we'll look at this verse a little bit, I think, tomorrow. But I want you to go to Romans chapter 16 and look what he says. Of course, you can quote it, I'm sure. 16.25, he says, Now to him who's able to establish. Establish you according to my doctrine. According, excuse me, according to my gospel. According to the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery. Kept secret since the world began. The idea here of, of being established. The idea here is to be fixed firmly. And I like the picture here because I think of someone pouring concrete. Quick creep. They don't call it quick for nothing. You've got to get in there because it's going to set up quickly. And when you look here, he talks about being established in my doctrine, established in, in the message of grace. It establishes you. It gives you a firm foundation. Listen, when you turn on the television today and you listen to all these people that are preaching on television, some of them are not so bad, but many of them are so deceptive. They use God as a ploy for money. They use God to, as a ploy to for business and strategies and all of this thing, all of these things. But they're not saying anything that will establish you in your faith. All they are, are they, all they are doing is for personal gain. That's exactly what they're using the Lord for. And some people fall for that. But Paul talks about establishing people, and we are growing in our relationship with Christ, and it involves our doctrine and what we believe. It also involves our lives. Uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13 if you would. Verse 11, as you know how we have uh, exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. 
Tells us a little bit about Paul's tenderness and, and desire to see that happen, to see these people grow. Um, but also he goes on that, we, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. For this reason we thank God, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. There's a couple of things here that I want to point out, and that is that the Word of God works in those who what? Believe. A lot of times when we look at something like that, we equate it to salvation. Yeah, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Listen, there are a lot of people we know that are saved that aren't living for the Lord and aren't walking for the Lord. And they are powerless in the Lord because of that. When Paul talks about that, talks about belief, he's talking about this idea of living a holy life of trusting Him daily. I think it is unfortunate that, that Pastor Ware had to make that announcement about the finances, and, and we all do. But I'll tell you something, it is an opportunity to see God work. We're not testing God. They didn't sign the contract with only 20 people there before last year, and they're going to say, well, we're going to believe the Lord. You know, they, they looked at the past and they did what they needed to do. But what I saw there is, okay, we talked about faith. Let's live it. Let's see God work to where when it happens, we look back and we say, look, look what God did. Again, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The excellency of the power may be of God and not me. And that's what living by faith is. See, we want the next step. We want to see where we go next. We want to see what's going to happen. I remember when I, I, I felt the Lord leading me into ministry. Number one, I didn't know what kind of ministry. I ended up going to Grace Bible College. I'm from Mobile, Alabama, a thousand miles away. I had my dad call, tell me, and my dad and mom were divorced. And, and my dad had minimal influence in my life, but I loved him. He's my dad. But I remember him looking at me and saying, don't go. I disobeyed. Um, anyway, um, I had my stepdad who I dearly love, and I dearly love my dad. Uh, um, he was a, my stepdad was a, a good fill-in father, and I don't mean to say that bad because I love him to death. And, and I just... Uh, the Lord blessed me with him in that sad circumstance. But, uh, but I just loved him to death. And, um, and he did those things that dads don't do. Dads do. He went to the ball games. He directed traffic for my football games. It was at every baseball game. And man, I just tear up. I, I, had to, I performed his funeral. And, and he's in glory. And I praise the Lord for that. Um, but it, it was so interesting. He called, he called me a fool. And, and, and oh, man, and, and my mom, can you, can you earn a living with that degree? You know, and that's what we hear. And that's, but the fact is, I knew that the Lord had changed my life and I knew I wanted to serve Him. I didn't know where, didn't know how. I took that step. And you know what? God has, has honored it. God has blessed. And God has led. And I thank the Lord for that. Um, I, I remember Dr. Vinton um, making some statements sometime, and he was president of the college at the time, and he said, it bothers me so deeply, and you know his heritage, if you know who he is, the deep heritage of missions and all of that, and, and he just said, it bothers me to go around the country and see people trying to get their kids out of ministry and to be doctors and lawyers. He says, it bothers me because they see that as less. They see that having that, that house on the lake be more, means more than serving the Creator who became my Savior and became the Savior of mankind. It is a noble calling. We are serving not the administrator of a hospital, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it is a glorious calling. And He provides. He provides. And I just praise the Lord. So Paul, now, you know, I'm, I'm going to be over time here. And, but I know there's lunch, so I better not be too, too much. I don't know if I will. But Paul saw it a necessity that men and women be built up in the faith. Be established to, so that they can, next point, so that they can demonstrate in their lives and be equipped to serve. We're not just established in the faith to say, look how much I know. We are established in the faith so we can serve at the pleasure of the Master. Amen. 
Whatever you want, wherever you go, want me to go, I will go. Paul demonstrated from his life, and of course he's our example, from his life and teaching that the believer was to be equipped to serve God. To serve God. Look over, if you would, at 2 Timothy. And the scriptures are, are just beautiful. Uh, just how the Lord led through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for Paul to write this. And, and even other writers. How they, they, I was thinking um, uh, this morning, uh, somebody said something about the yearning for Christ and uh, um, um, loving Christ. And I thought of that psalm that says, It's a dear pants for one. So my soul longs after what a beautiful picture. The thirsty, thirsting for God. Paul demonstrated from his life and teaching that the believers was to be equipped to serve God. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and uh, verse in chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And this idea of being strong, again, present tense, passive voice. Continuous action, but an outside force is making him strong. He says, be strong, in, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It also implies something else in Paul's life. As we talked about in Philippians about him knowing Christ and pressing on, pressing up, pressing forward, is this. The idea of being strong, he's talking to Apostle Paul here. Or he's actually he's talking to Timothy here. And he's telling Timothy, Timothy do what? I want you to grow stronger. I want you to not stay put, but I want you to grow. Incidentally, when you read 2 Timothy, and I think it is important, um, as all of Paul's epistles, but 2 Timothy is his last one. And I think as, as, as he writes this book, and we know from later in, in, the, in, the, in the letter, that he knows that this is probably going to be it for him. So when we read this, we say, wait a second, these are Paul's final uh, final words to his his um, his young uh, uh, protege, uh, his young son in the faith. But he says, "Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus." And I won't get anybody uh, step on anybody's toes. Uh, Ephesians six chapter ten says, "Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might." Present tense, passive voice again. Um, as I read this. This idea of continuation and continually growing. Um, you know, we hear people talk about, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really growing. I'm just kind of in a holding pattern. You know, there's no such thing as that. There really isn't. Um, when you think of a, a jet that's flying, I, I like to fly because it just gets me where I want to go quicker than driving. <laughs> that's it. And, uh, you know, I, I like to fly. I like to get there. I like to take off some landings and all that. They're fun. As long as they go well, they're great. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because a jet airplane, and it, I flew in a 747 one time, and I was, I think, the last person on board because my plane didn't, well, my plane had a malfunction, and they, they shifted me over. And I, and I think it was, they said this thing would hold over, over 400, almost 500 people. And this jet comes down, and he is bound to this earth with those tires by what? Gravity. And that, as that jet, jet goes, and gravity takes over, gravity is holding that jet down, right? But thrust takes over with the engines. And the thrust pushes and pushes and pushes, and it gets faster and faster. And of course, the pilot tweaks, his, he tweaks the, the wings. And I'm not a pilot, so you can tell by my lingo here, it's pretty, pretty crude. He, he tweaks the wings. I don't think that's scientific term. And he, he turns them in such a way where it creates more of, a, of a, an air flow across the wings. And what happens there is lift takes place. Thrust and lift overcome the drag of gravity. You're flying in that jet, but when those jet engines stop, and if you're not safely on the ground, you will be coming down. Jets don't glide very well. Because every time you tell that story, you say, oh, yeah, but they can glide. Not, jets don't do that very well. They're not built to glide. They're built to overcome gravity by thrust. I don't believe the Christian is built to glide. The Christian is built to fly. Not to glide. And when we, think, when we stop growing, when we stop learning, when we stop trusting, 
it's, it doesn't take long for that world to start coming in. Amen. To where our thinking, we don't think so much anymore that maybe, maybe there are many ways to heaven. And you say, well, you know, I know this group probably is not, is not there. Although, I'll tell you how many of us, and don't raise your hand, know somebody who is there. And maybe you know that they're believers, and yet through maybe schooling or through not involved in a fellowship, a church that's growing and that they're learning, have kind of started drifting back. And it's not quick necessarily. It could be subtle. But all of a sudden now, they don't have time for the Word of God. They don't have time for church. And their lives start to change. The Apostle Paul established, talks about establishing believers in the faith so that they can be equipped to serve. Years ago, I was listening to a, a radio program and Jim, James Dobson um, was, was focused on the family and he had a, a Christian... Um, a Christian counselor on there and they were and, and Dobson asked the guy he said listen he said I see a problem out there with a lot of our young people he says they go to a Christian college or a college could be Christian or not uh, and they get involved there and they start going and before you know it they are not standing for the Word of God in fact they don't even ever attend, to attend church anymore it's almost like they feel they've outgrown it and he asked the, the, the Christian counselor, uh, maybe the guy was over a Christian school, I don't remember. And he says, why do you think that is? And he says, well, what happens is they go there and they stop attending a church. They stop attending a church. They get involved in schooling and they make them all these excuses, but they quit serving in the church and being a part of an assembly and being part of a Christian community. And, and before you know it, the world starts... And I'll tell you, the college campus is a tough place to be. It is a tough place to be. And I praise the Lord for ministries that are on college campuses who are standing for the Lord. But it is a tough place to be. It is a dark place to be. Paul demonstrated that he wanted to see the believer equipped to serve. And he says here, let's go on down as he talks to Timothy here. He says, in the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, Timothy, you commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Pass it along. Pass it along. Have a Timothy. I've heard this as a pastor. We need to have Timothys that we're working with and we're spending a little extra time with. Someone said to me one time, and I didn't like it at the time when I was in college, a, a pastor of a church, fairly large church, and he said, um, I'm going to tell you ministry students something. He says, when you are involved in a church, you need to spend the majority of your time with the people that are growing. Amen. Well, I'm thinking, I'm this young punk. Um, now I'm an old punk, but I was young then. I'm thinking, you know, oh, come on. What about the other people out there? They need more, you know. But boy, as I got into ministry, I started to realize, you know, he's right. He said, because those people want to serve the Lord, you want to encourage that. You, you, not, that you, not that you don't spend time with other people. That's not what he was saying. But he says you want to encourage those who are spiritually minded. You want to see those people grow. You want to continue to feed them. And you hope that others come along. And you want to encourage them to come along. But if they don't come along, you need to stay focused on those people who want to grow. Paul says to pass it along. Uh, Pastor Stam in his, his commentary, and I like this, it says leave a legacy. Leave a legacy. When you leave, that there's somebody else to step into that role or somebody else who's equipped to stand up and to preach or to lead, leave, leave a legacy, Paul. He also says, um, he also told Timothy in this idea of, of leaving a legacy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 12. You know this verse. Uh, he says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believer or in, in, in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Until I come give attention to the reading and exhortation and, uh, to doctrine. We'll look at that a little further. But what did he say? This idea of leaving, leaving a legacy is that we need to be examples of the faith. We need to be examples uh, to people around us. They are, they are watching us. 
Paul goes on down in this passage back in 2 Timothy. And we're going to kind of walk through this uh, fairly rapidly here. But he uses the picture of a soldier. He says, Paul, uh, Timothy, you endure a hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Um, a distracted soldier is a dead soldier. Uh, he says, suffer hardship as a good soldier. He must endure through tough times. And we know through Paul's life that he did. He must be, and let's look at this. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. He must be a focused soldier. Uh, one uh, historian put it this way. Roman soldiers at the time were strictly for, forbidden to be engaged in civilian affairs during his time of service. Um, it's called the Theodosius Code, or the Roman Code of Theodosius. We forbid men engaged on military service or in military service to engage in civilian occupations. Uh, one, one historian made this statement. The Roman soldier was expected to keep one thing in view and only one, service to his commander. He was not allowed to marry or engaged in agriculture, trade, or manufacturing. He was a soldier and can, could not do anything else. Paul says to endure as a good soldier and no one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this world. I use this illustration and I hate to use it, but I do it. it to me, it frames it so well. I have heard and seen so many people who would go into Christian ministry except for debt. They are so entangled in the cares of this world that they won't do it. They can't. We'd love to go on the mission and feel we felt we've always felt like we wanted to, but you know we've got a house, we've got this, we've got that, and it's unfortunate. But sometimes the affairs of the world close in around us. Paul goes on and he says, uh, in verse 5, he says, If anyone competes as an athlete, and what does he say about that? Not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So this idea of competing as an athlete is that you make no shortcuts. In other words, it's God's way. I love what uh, Hebrews 4.12 where it talks about the sharper than any two-edged sword. And at the end of the verse it says, The Word of God judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know why I like that? And the Lord, Lord struck that, or, or showed that to me as I was reading sometimes, just really touched my heart with it, is this, that no matter how I feel, I have to judge it according to the Word of God. Because you know as well as I do, sometimes how you feel is not biblical. Oh, I know you're Christians. And I am too. Sometimes how we feel is not biblical. And we need to go back to the Word of God and judge. God uses the Word of God to judge the thoughts and the intents of my heart. And I go back to the Word and it says, don't do this or do this. And I look at my life. And if my life is off, then I need to move it back. Amen. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Word of God is our judge. And let me say this along with that. You can honestly see how easy it is if our feelings become our judge. If our feelings become what motivates and moves us. And if we walk away from the Word of God, from that, 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 daily, that daily time in the Word of just feasting. And I, I, I hesitate on this because I don't want to make it a ritual. But listen, we, if you're a believer, and Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then shouldn't we want to know more about Him? And you don't know more about him by reading the newspaper. You just don't. We have the Word of God before us. And it is a beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful letter from him uh, telling us how he wants us to live today. And it's just, just a wonderful thing. So Paul talks about the soldier. Paul talks about an athlete. Uh, Paul talks in verse 6 about a farmer. And he doesn't just say a farmer. He says a hard-working farmer. I, and I'll say this, and I've never been a farmer, nor have I played one on television. I, I'm not a farmer. But I've known farmers, and I'll tell you this. He says a hard-working farmer. I honestly have never met a farmer that wasn't a hard-working farmer, that was a farmer for very long. <laughs> because they work, it's their lives. Especially, I've, I've, I've known some people who were involved in dairy farming. Oh, man. I mean, I lived in the suburbs. Dairy farming. Wow, that's their lives. That's... 
You know, but, but he says a hardworking farmer. Well, what about the hardworking farmer? He's blessed. He's blessed as a result of his labor. On down, though, when we get to this passage that we know, this, 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 this uh, verse that I've, I think I've heard once here already, it says, uh, be diligent or study, we know, to present yourself approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He calls him a workman, a workman that's not lazy, a workman that is approved, a workman that rightly divides the word of truth. We live in a society here, folks, that doesn't care about the Word of God. And I'm not, I'm not just getting on a soapbox about that. That's, that's obvious to us. But, but they don't care or they're moving away from right and wrong or absolute truth to a relative postmodern way of thinking. That it really doesn't matter what, what, you know, what you say and what you think because that's just you and that's right for you, but that's not right for you. Um, it, and, and, and we base things on feeling instead of truth, and instead of right. And I'll tell you an example of that. In our last election, and I'm not going to get into that and all that, and I, but I, so just hear me out. You had Barack Obama running against who? Hillary Clinton for the, for the nomination. What did Hillary Clinton run on? Experience. And she had it because she was the wife of the president before. That's all I'm going to say about that. What did Barack Obama run on? Hope and change. Hillary Clinton ran on experience, Obama, hope and change. John McCain wins the, the Republican nomination. What does he run on? Experience. Did he have experience? Yeah, he had been president before, but he had quite a bit of experience in government and all this, the military and all this. I don't care what you think about him. Um, Barack Obama ran on what? Hope. You probably should remember that. Hope and change. Who won? It didn't matter what he did. It didn't matter where he came from. It didn't matter how much experience he had. The people who got him into office were looking for what? Hope and change. I thought about this last night when I, in reference to what I was talking about yesterday. You can go up to someone and tell them that you have hope and your life has been changed. And I believe there's a message there to the postmodern world. Amen. We have been changed in Christ and we have hope in the Savior. And that's, that was free. That was that illustration to decide. I wanted to work that in because it just, but it shows our society. It shows where we're at. We say, the Bible says this, and they say, so? Let me, get my, let me get the Quran out. I'll show you what it says. They need to see Christ living in and through us. They need to see Christ alive. And we should not be ashamed of what we believe and stand on it. And they look at us and they say, I know it's true because I've seen His life. And when he says that Jesus Christ died for, the, for his sins, was buried and rose again, and he has assurance of salvation, you know what? I'm not sure about that because I, I, you know, I've been taught all these other things. But man alive, that guy's life has changed, and I want what he has. Amen. And it's Jesus Christ that he wants. It's, it's Christ living in us. We have been called to serve. We have been called. And he uses all these pictures. He uses the farmer. He uses the, the athlete that's running court, according to the rules. He uses the soldier. He uses the approved workman that rightly divides the word of truth. It's interesting, and I believe that it is important. What does the Bible say? What are the words of the Bible? Pastor Ware went back through to the idea of the church. And this is what the church was. This is the church, this is the, the kingdom church, or this is the church of, of the little flock in the gospels. This is the church that continues. It's important to look at the words. It's important to listen to the words of God and understand that they mean something. It's not a feel-good thing. It's the word of God written on the paper and they mean things. I, I use this illustration kind of funny. When I was in high school, um, I was in a chemistry class and um, I didn't always listen. And I'm sitting up there in this class. I usually sat pretty close to the front because it kind of kept me out of trouble. And, uh, okay, the teacher made me sit up in the front. And, and I'm, I'm listening to Miss Matthews. And here's what we did this day. She said something to this effect. 
What we're going to do today, class, is uh, in a little while, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk back into to the back of the room and I'm going to pour some hydrochloric acid into a, a, into a cup and, and you can see it work and all this and, and, and we were going to have some kind of an experiment. Here's what I heard. Hydrochloric acid in a cup in the back. That's what I heard. So when she said, okay, let's go kids, let's go on to the back of the class. I went to the back of the class, I went and pulled the thing up that had all the, the fans on it that draws the fumes out. I went in, pulled it up, grabbed the, the, the flask of hydrochloric acid out of there, went over to my beaker, poured it in the cup. Put it down, and she comes running up to me, and she says, "What?" Are you? And she was she was nice, but I think if if it weren't school, she swore at me. But she yells at me, "What are you doing?" Uh, you know, and I'm playing dumb because all I heard was cup, acid, cup. You know, pour, and and and, I, and what was happening there was the fact is that the acid was eating through the beaker and was eating a hole in the in the in the table in the school. And now she had to grab the, the, the beaker, get it somewhere where she could dilute it with some type of chemical or whatever. I don't know. At that point, I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, you know what I'm saying? Not my fault. Okay. Um, but, but the fact is this, you know, and that's a simple and it's a dumb little illustration I remember from school. But, but you know, the Word of God means something. And what about that, that little illustration where someone believes that they have to work their way to heaven? And they're holding on to that. They're holding on to their sacraments or whatever it is. And they realize that it's through Jesus Christ alone. The Bible says they'll die and go to hell because they're not trusting in the finished work of Christ. Or they're living in some other promise and wondering why God's not giving them that financial wealth or, or that struggle. Or the Bible is confusing. Um, you don't know how many times I've heard people say that when they started understanding the mystery and understanding the concept of God and the dispensation of the grace today, and some of you are in this, in this boat, that, that one missionary told me when he shared it in Malaysia, um, this lady who had been hearing all this health and wealth and all this healing and all this other stuff, she was so confused. But when she read this book on dispensationalism by Joel Fink called The Mystery, she said when she read that and heard the... the, the um, the uh, missionary talk about understanding your Bible rightly divided, she made the statement, she said, the fog lifted. And you can start understanding what God is doing today. Right. So when we look at this, the Apostle Paul uses these, uh, these examples to demonstrate service, to demonstrate a life that's, that's pleasing to him. Uh, number three, and number three almost didn't make it to my notes. And I finished my notes and was going back over them, and then I realized, wait a second, I'm talking about ministry, and I didn't say anything about Paul and the local church. And so I, I quickly um, changed that. But Paul was committed to the existence and the function and the growth of the local church. He does it so much so, you think, well, how, well, how committed was he? Well, the question we could ask ourselves about anything Paul did, how committed was he? He was committed with his life. And we find that if you go to 2 Corinthians, uh, the passage uh, in chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and you know this verse, and this is one of those verses that you just look at and you're just amazed at his life and, his, and what he'd gone through. And I'll read it just to give some background. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Verse 22, chapter 11, 2 Corinthians. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. I am more. In laborers, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, uh, often. And you know right away, they can't say that. Um, he goes on, verse 24. From the Jews, I received 40 stripes minus one. Uh, five times, pardon me. Verse, I want to minimize that. Verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I had been in the deep. In journeys often in perils and waters and perils of robbers. Wait a second, come on. I thought when we trusted Jesus as our Savior that we had plenty of money and no problems and wore nice clothes. That's not what he says here. 
He says, in my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Wherever he went, he was in peril. And, that, and he says, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fast, fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Verse 28, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all churches. Paul was committed to the establishing of churches with his life. And I want you to go back to Acts chapter 14 if you would. And if you don't want to go there, I'll read it. But we know Paul and Paul was stoned in Lystra. Um, we know that uh, chapter 19 and it, it accounts this really interesting passage. And, and if you read the first part of the passage, uh, this is southern Galatia. I believe this is to where the Galatians, the book of Galatians was written, but that's another issue. But it's interesting because uh, what did they want to do in the previous verses? They wanted to worship Paul. They wanted to, they wanted to lavish upon them uh, uh, offerings, and you have that. And in fact, um, verse 17, nevertheless, he did not leave himself, and this is his witness, this is Paul's preaching without witness that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, um, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And you can, you can almost see the crowd building. Yes, yes, yes. So much so. In verse 18, and with these sayings, they scarcely could restrain the multitude from sacrificing to them. At this point, I was thinking what we would do is do an offering because they're ready, they're primed. But they're ready. Oh, we want to sacrifice to Paul. Hail, hail, hail. Verse 19. And then the Jews from Antioch, those dreaded Jews from Antioch, and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, that's a wishy-washy group if I've ever heard of one. Now, if you read the historians, Galatians, they were known for that. This is a perfect example. Um, and, and whether he was dead or not, they thought he was dead. And I can guarantee you whether he was dead or not, he didn't look good. <laughs> Verse 20, however, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Antioch, going right back through there, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in faith, saying that we must, uh, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And how do we know he was establishing churches and cared for churches? The next verse says, so when they had appointed elders in every church. Paul did not cut and run because somebody didn't like him. There are a lot of churches out there that have been just gutted because people walk away because they got in a tick. Oh, things are, they, they just, you know, Martha said this. Well, when Martha comes in that door, I'm going out that door. Or the pastor said something that offended them and all. Oh, they just, they want to go to a place where they can just kind of be part of the woodwork and not do anything. That's not what we were designed for. We were designed to serve the Savior. Not be busy, but serve the Savior. And there's a difference. Paul was committed to the existence of the, the local church with his life. Paul was committed to the function of the local church. And um, we're going we're gonna to get there. We're going to do this rapidly. Um, we're going to um, 1 Timothy, if you would, verse 3, 15. Verse you know, I'm sure. He says, but if I am delayed, I write that you, may, that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, the church, the, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground or the pillar and the support of the truth. Paul calls the local church the pillar and the support of the truth. And the idea of the function of the church is the function is the pillar and support of the truth. The function is also where believers get fellowship, receive encouragement. And we won't go there, but if you read Philippians, Paul got encouragement and fellowship from the Philippian church and others. Um, also, this idea of the church is for growing and growth. 
He says, the, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And he talks about speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This idea of growing in the faith, and we get that from the local church. Number four, the Apostle Paul confronted false doctrine, for he knew that it would undermine the gospel of the grace of God. He did not ignore it. He warned them, and, and back in Acts chapter 20, and if you would turn there, Acts chapter 20, Verses 24 through verse 22, or 32, and we, we've already looked at this, or someone's read it. Paul says this in verse 24 of Acts 20. Um, but none of these things move me, nor do I count it dear to myself, so that I may finish the, the race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus is testifying the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed now... I know that you all among whom I also have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Later we know they cried over that. And we go on, he says, Therefore I testify to you this day, and I am appointed I, uh, this day, uh, that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to, to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to, the, to shepherd the church of God, which is purchased um, with His own blood. And verse 29 says, For I know that, this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, and draw the disciples after themselves. I want you to notice some, just a couple things. The obvious here is Paul is warning them. Notice what he says. Take heed to yourselves and to the flock of God. Take heed to yourselves. The personal comes before the pastoral. The personal comes before the pastoral. What I'm saying is this, that if we are not growing, how can we expect to be faithful and effective ministers of Jesus Christ? He says, take heed to yourselves and to the flock of God and that you protect and you provide and that the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy And I'm going to read these verses and make just a, a, a couple of comments. He says um, in verse 2 Timothy 2, 23 and following, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, pay, pay, able to teach patience. In humility, correcting those in opposition... If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may, may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having taken, been taken captive by him to do his will. Now I want to say this to you. I believe Paul is talking about believers. And, and some people may say, oh no, brother, you know they're saved. I call that the boy, boy, in, the, the boy in the plastic bubble theology. I get saved and nothing else can harm me. That's false. Half of our, 98% of what Paul talked about was for the believer to stand strong and not allow the world to, to, to take over them. And who's behind the world? Who's, who's the God of this world? He says here, I believe that, that, that believers can be ensnared by Satan. And I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to think about this. How many of you here today know of some believer that you know they're saved? You really do. You've seen it. You know they are. Uh, but yet, when they left the church, it was a scorched earth mentality. I'm going to take everybody with me and I'm going to destroy it. And Satan goes, you go. Paul says to confront false doctrine and false teaching. Paul also, we won't turn here in Titus, says after the, the first and second admonition, you do what? Three strikes and you're gone. On the first one you warn, on the second one you warn, third time you're done. 
And there is a time and place in the church to ask someone to leave. But in closing, and I will just end here in to say this, that God has called us. He's not, he has called us to grow in our understanding, to know, but He's also called us to reckon. He's also called us to reckon and to consider it and accept it for what it is personally. And then He's also called us to what? Yield and present ourselves. Why? So that God can lead us and direct us and place us in ministry opportunities where He gets the glory. Father, thank You. And we praise You. And may our hearts be open to what You have in store for us. We pray these things in Christ's name.